evening, sir. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, all seniors. Uh, I'm Dr. Jaisa. I'm uh, practicing in Jamnagar, uh, Gujarat. Uh, it's a peripheral town, so uh, unfortunately, we don't have a uh, cath lab facility. I have to send the patient uh, to Rajkot. Uh, it's a one-hour uh, journey. So in uh, all cases, IV thrombolysis or as a bridging, uh, it's very important to us. Uh, uh, so I'm presenting a, a small and good case. Uh, can you share uh, the slide? Yes, yes, I'm sharing. Yeah. Um, it's a 59 year gentleman, right handed individual, and uh, artist by profession. He's a, a piano vadak. It's very important uh, to know his uh, profession uh, as far as the stroke is concerned. Uh, he's basically a known case of uh, hypertension, uh, type 2 DM, and uh, he had coronary artery disease uh, since last uh, six years, uh, seven years, and on irregular treatment with uncontrolled hypertension and diabetic. There was no addiction ex except some tobacco chewing occasionally. Uh, next, please. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, yes, yes. There is some issue. Yes. Uh, he had presented with history of uh, sudden onset of weakness of the right upper limb in the form of uh, difficulty in gripping the objects and uh, uh, some deviation of the face towards the left with some slurring of the speech of uh, some, uh, uh, basically had Broca's aphasia, mild. Onset of weakness around uh, uh, 900 hours uh, in the morning, uh, presented to us around, uh, uh, within two hours, around 11 o'clock uh, in the morning uh, with all the symptoms. On initial assessment uh, on vitals, his pulse is 109. Uh, it was irregular, misbits was there. Blood pressure was 136 by 94. Uh, random blood sugar was 278. Uh, his ECG suggested of fetal fibrillations. Uh, urgent CT was done uh, within a few minutes uh, as in how cities we have. So it's normal aspect score was 10. Uh, his NHS score was on four only as far as the clinical scenario was concerned. Only some right uh, facial paresis, right facial labial uh, fold was uh, uh, this and motor right upper limb weakness power uh, means uh, score wise it, it was two because he had uh, some uh, hand uh, 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 weakness also there and language wise only mild uh, uh, um, weakness was there so given the score was one so the NHS score was uh, four next slide so CT was normal uh, so after CT as far as the guidelines concerned means FDA approved RTPA was there. I'm using that. But uh, as far as the uh, pocket friendly and the patient is not affording for uh, RTPA, I'm used the tenectep plus 16 milligram 8 ml as far as the weight is 80.7 kg. His post thrombolysis NIHS was good. It was improved uh, and uh, only some speech difficulty was there. This was the next slide. This was the MRI as we can see the diffusion restriction with the some medicine uh, values and uh, the NGO was suggestive of left MC occlusion below uh, above, means uh, ahead of M1 with the carotid NGO was normal. So post thrombolysis, next slide please. Post thrombolysis is we can see is a very good opening of the M1. We don't require the uh, mechanical, means sent for the mechanical thrombectomy as far as the clinical as well as NGO was concerned. It was improved. So the, the only small message is the thrombolysis with a NHS score, but having a major clinical deficit, sometimes we get, we are dealing with the major deficit or might be we are dealing with the large vessel occlusions, which affect the patient outcome and his profession. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hello. <clears throat> yeah, I think that is a that is a that is a good case, and the message is that we should uh, we should always give probably IVTPA first. 
because 30 percent of the blocks also can open mechanical can open more than that mechanical can open up to 70 percent <clears throat> or even more than that 90 percent but even iv thrombolysis can open so this has happened with us also many times and in fact tenetoplase has thought to be better than eltoplase in opening the large vessel so so i think that message is well taken uh, minakshi over to you Thank you, sir. That's a great case, really, because this is what was shown in that extend IATNK trial, I think. These were a set of patients who were, you know, scheduled for thrombectomy with a window of 4.5 hours. And then uh, these patients were given initial, you know, uh, tenectiplase. I think it was compared with altiplase. Yeah, it was compared with altiplase and the opening was 22% with the tenectiplase and 10% with altiplase. So much so that uh, Bruce Campbell wrote that uh, if you give tenectiplase, place, the chance of this patient being taken up for mechanical thrombectomy greatly decreases. Absolute almost 12% was noticed. So probably this is one of those cases. Uh, Dr. Nakpal, proceed with IV throm. Sorry, sir. Okay. Okay, sir. I think I lost Even if the, Are you able to hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Even if there is a large vessel occlusive disease, we should not hesitate to give IV thrombolysis. That's a key message here. In fact, the second study which comes to my mind is the Tempo 1 data where the negative place in, uh, you know, stroke with a proven occlusion in minor strokes, like this is like this cannot be considered exactly minor, though NHS stroke scale is four. You have a Broca's aphasia component sitting there. So today's criteria, though NIH is less than five, it goes through one of those exclusions in the form of language deficits. But there also it was shown that uh, with an active place, with proven occlusion, there was opening up of the vessel. So those two trials are actually collaborative with this case. The only doubt I have with the speaker is this. Sir, you did the CD scan and then you thrombolyzed and then yeah, you showed then... two MRIs, one without opening and one with opening. What sir, was that actually? I didn't get that actually. So I've done a CT scan on the CT scan itself, uh, given a bolus uh, in place. Uh, after CT, you're done, uh, go for the MRI. Yeah. And that MRI, what did it show? It showed block. Yeah, the, the block. Uh... And when was the MRI repeated? The second MRI. Uh, the second MRI repeated after 24 hours. Uh, that is a normal. There was no any uh, the the ICH or anything on the uh, bleed was there. So there is one deviation in the guideline. If I may just point out, the case is ex extraordinary because the patient has improved clinically, and you have got a vessel also opened up. But today's guidelines say that if you have an occlusion, even if the patient has improved, let us say even if the NHS has become absolutely okay. You have to go and open up the vessel is what is actually being practiced. At least our interventionists, that is the way they practice without opening. I mean, you just straight away take up for patients for endovascular and try to open up the vessel. So fortunately, this mm -hmm. opened on its own. I'd like to hear the comments of uh, Paul, sir, and Nagpal, sir, on this count. No, uh, see, <clears throat> the, uh, today's recommendations are and what is done in practice also is that you give IVTPA or connect uh, uh, place anyway. And if it's a blocked vessel, you don't repeat the MRA to check whether it has opened or you straightway take it to endovascular. But what will happen is that many times when they are doing DSA, they find the vessel is open. In that case, they will close the procedure. They won't anyway again do the procedure. But, uh, but there is no need. But the recommendation, because you waste time in that procedure to do the MRA again and all this. You just stay, uh, you know, after giving IVT, you take to DSA. And yeah, I agree with you. That is that, that, that is the current practice. I think Dr. Nagpal may give his comment. Yeah, I think uh, it depends upon the place where you are practicing. Yeah. See, he is in a place at Jamnagar and Advocate identify because I also come from Jabalpur, where the intervention facilities are not available. And if the patient is improving, it is very difficult to convince that patient to go undergo a DSA further. So it is, uh, it, I think what he has done in this situation is perfectly justified. Okay. So now the, what we would have done here is that we thrombolize whatever the, if there is no bleed, you find out a reason to thrombolize. 
go for thrombolysis, which is the other way around. Don't look at the contraindication unless something is glaring at you. You see blood there. And we th thrombolize the patient. Now, whether these patients should go for the bridge, if available, all of these, is a matter of contention. Now, since this patient has done very well, even with IV thrombolysis, it makes a point that not every patient requires a mechanical thrombectomy. Correct. So I think so my question, a, my, yeah, my yeah, question yes, to, uh, to Dr. Shah is, uh, when you gave IV TPA, yes, how much time you noticed that there was clinical improvement of his uh, aphasia and of his uh, brachial parasite? In how so much time the, you noticed? Was it immediate on the table or did it take 24 hours? Or was it? Uh, sir, basically some patients like this, some having... No, a in this patient I'm asking, in this patient. In this patient, in how uh, much yeah. time he, he made a... Uh, in this patient, in how much time within, he made... Within clinical. one hour. This patient improved within, within one hour. 45 minutes to one hour. Because I think it may, it may be a, a cardioembolic stroke, which is which very soft, uh, which, uh, which thrombolyzes very well. So uh, these patients improve within 45 minutes to one hour. So there was any way he could not afford mechanical thrombectomy and all. Yes, sir, because he 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 doesn't having the money to I mean, spend of even RTPA. It's uh, three times costlier than the tenacte place. Yes. So he's not affording. So it's I think it's better to do something rather than do that is true. Do that nothing. is true. That is true. that is completely well taken. It is definitely we must give IV TPA, and if the patient is affordable and if you are in a setting as Dr. Nagpal mm -hmm. says. If the patient has not completely improved, take him to an endovascular lab. But then if the patient mm. cannot afford and if you are in a remote area, then definitely this is the maximum you can do there and also very good. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the maximum recovery which happens in the TPA, uh, eritipalase, and same is true about tenecteplase also, is uh, to be seen at 24 hours, not, at, uh, not immediately. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, without prejudice, I have a question. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, without prejudice to the company, right? Yeah. So, what is your current uh, thinking? How do you rate tenecteplase versus actilase? You're asking me, or you're yeah, asking yes, the company? Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I am asking not. I am not asking <laughs> yes. the company. I know the company's answer. <laughs> no, so but the, I, the, think, the... I think I think Meenakshi wants to answer that question. So it's better that I will divert <laughs> it to Meenakshi <laughs> because he has raised his finger. That, Meenakshi, you have your finger. See, if you look at that, almost all are the same. Even the meta-analysis, which uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Kameshwar Prasad group, they published, they almost the same. Sarah has published that. But the point is that if you look at only one parameter, as Kalsar was just pointing out, see, if you look at the long-term outcomes, they may be comparable. But the very acute outcome, if you look at that, the dramatic improvement they talk about, four-point improvement in an age stroke scale, that is one thing which has been seen more often with tenecteplase than altiplase. That's one point which they have really scored in uh, data wise. The long term outcomes may be comparable. I will leave it to the others to decide upon that. Is that correct, sir? Yeah. No. You see, if uh, the the issue is that if you look at the studies individually one by one, in no study in no study tenecteplase has been found to be inferior because I have studied this whether it's a study from Scotland, whether it's a study from New Zealand, whether it's a study from Australia, whether it's a study from India. There is not a single study I'm aware, or whether it's a study from Nortest from Norway. There is not a single study where it has been found to be inferior. It may not have been found to be superior, although in extent intra-arterial they have found little superiority, but otherwise it is non-inferior. So that means it is as good. But still it gets a weaker recommendation. And why... If you see American guidelines, it is recommended now, but its recommendation is weaker than that of Altiplase. The reason for that is that for giving strong recommendations, they need more studies and more follow-up. In the more studies, more because it's a new drug, so therefore its recommendation is weak. If you take European guidelines, if you take American guidelines, all guidelines are recommended, but it has, they have given it a lower place. Than, and the reason for that is not because the trials are shown, because there are less trials, and because there are the trials have not been uh, you know, the time period is only last two, three years. There is, is multiplicity. Otherwise, they, from the survey of literature, they look equal. They look equal. 
one practical advice, Dr. Jayesha, sir. One thing which we have learned, I have to tell you. So you specifically said that the patient was not able to offer. But when this happens to better as uh, this patient, actually, ideally, within guidelines, we must offer endovascular. And if we are finding that it is open, we are going to come out. But let the decision be taken by the family, even if the patient has improved. And we have seen that when there is a major vessel occlusive disease, they can deteriorate. At the time, one uncle will crop up or one cousin brother's son will come who would be, you know, coming and trying to make some noise and saying, why you did not do it? And our own colleagues, sometimes they let us down. Oh, you should have come early. So document it in the case file that this patient did not offer. I offered the chance for them to go for endovascular and they didn't take it. Write it in native language. Preferably, even if the family is not signing it, you documented at that same ink which, which you documented the previous and at the same time put the time. Sir, sir that, that, that was done and I have taken the consent also. Yeah, okay, then fine. Thank you. Just express it to us also because that's very it has happened. That later on they will say, we never said we cannot afford, no? True, that sir. will come True. back immediately strongly at us when the patient True, doesn't sir. do well. Here they wouldn't do it because they did very well. But the patient who doesn't do well, they will really come back. True, sir. And they will because they would say that even after spending 30,000 rupees which the doctor gobbled up, the patient did not improve and did not even answer anything. Very that true. will be the answer for them. Yeah. But that's a really great case. The opening of uh, the point which you have highlighted for us is that a major vessel gets opened up when you give IV thrombolysis, especially with tenecti place obviating the need for mechanical intervention. That was the learning point we had from your... Meenakshi, case. I tell you, I have had this because I'm older than Jay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm older than you also. <laughs> That's my only <laughs> claim to fame, that I'm old man. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this has similar stories I remember now. I had once a patient, I was traveling actually, and during travel somebody called me from the hospital that um, there is a so-and-so patient, there's a complete block, and what to do? I said, call the interventionalist. And the in we had only one interventionist. See, most of the hospitals either have no interventionalist or there's only one who's very much in demand. And they said this interventionalist is not available. Why? Because he has gone to attend an intervention conference. <laughs> so, see, that shows the effect of conferences on patient care. <laughs> he said, sir, he has gone to Bombay. He's not available because he has gone to attend an intervention conference. And intervention is something which you cannot do by telemedicine. IVTPA you can do, IV place you can do. But intervention you have to hold. I said, okay. I was very, very, you know, unhappy. I said, okay, what to do? I was also traveling. I said, okay, give, 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 give thrombolytic agent. We'll see. And uh, by next day when I went to hospital, I found he was completely all right. And in fact, I show that case often in my conference. He had completely rekindling. And similarly, another time also I had the same experience. And then I looked at the literature. Actually, if you look at the literature, 30% of these large vessels, which can involve the major vessel and which can involve the branches also. Usually branches get. But sometimes even the M1 also depends on the composition of the clot. And you know how the, the, the clot composition varies. If, if it is an ICAD clot, it will not dissolve. Or ICAD, even mechanical, is a very difficult thing because it is you know, embedded in that. But if it is a cardioembolic clot or a clot of unknown source, they can many times, this um, thrombolytic IV thrombo. So they, therefore, it's a good thing. Uh, and uh, uh, even in these uh, intervention studies also, they have shown that many times when they go to inter I've also seen this. Many times when they go to intervention, they think that many... Many times the IV itself has done the done the good job. So, so it's a very well, a good message and uh, it reinforces that concept. And in this, as you rightly said, connect place has been thought to be better, the trials wise. That, in fact, there was a hope that hope could not be fulfilled when the when the connect place company was promoting connect place, when it was promoting, you know. In that, this was also one of the promotional points that it will replace mechanical thrombectomy. But that dream could not be <laughs> fulfilled. It could not replace it. They were so excited that it is because there was some data in extent trial, you know, where they had shown 
even before extend, they had shown that there was some tendency to recanalize the large arteries. But then subsequently we learned that there may be a little advantage, but it cannot really replace much. I think the biggest advantage then, of, uh, yeah, please. Sir, the sir, biggest, sir, sir. No, it's, okay. The, it's okay. The biggest advantage which we found at connective places is ease of administration. Yeah, so that that is one thing is which is which is see you are not there at uh, the bedside and you just give a bolus and so it is, and it's gone so you don't have to document the time when it is given not the time when it started and when it ended and it whether the infusion was slow and dissolution and this so the, all this is gone so that is our biggest advantage. And one hour of tension is not. Yeah, there. yeah. <laughs> go, and, go and give it this go. way or that way. Yeah, yeah. So that's right. An advantage during Corona time. Yes. Really, we have just did not have to go near the patient. Just give it and come off. Sir, one thing, sir, the, before the advent of tentative place, when the recanalization rates were actually being looked at, only when alteplase was available, there was percentages in one of the data that spontaneous recanalization, 24.1%. With the IV alteplase, it was 47%. With the intra-arterial alone, it was 63%. Intra-arterial as a bridge to intravenous was only 67%. That is only, it added only 4% in that data. And the mechanical with penumbral device was 83%. So this was the original. So probably it was a spontaneous recanalization with 24%. So I had also an incidence like that, sir. We had a patient who came beyond the IV thrombolytic window, referred to us for only mechanical thrombectomy and with a dense deficit. And we did for the first time, our angiography in our hospital, I think it was CT or MR angiogram, I'm not remembering right now, sir. We did that angiogram and we found that there was a major vessel occlusive disease and we immediately took the patient for intervention. Inside, we went there, the, the, the angiography time to the needle and going inside could not have been more than 10, 15 minutes. Sir. That is all. Only shaving and take up, that is all. Everything was ready. We used the coat stroke and we went inside. And when we went inside, the vessel was completely open, sir. The argument was that why the vessel opened up. Now, the argument was that it could have been spontaneous. But then it was eight hours or so for the travel to reach us. We are opening at eight hours. What it did not open in eight hours, what happened in that 15 minutes? So our interventional radiologist, Dr. John said, sir, we give heparin to flush, whether it opened up. So I want to know really the veracity of this statement. Does heparin flush really open vessels? Does it really happen, sir? No, by anecdotal, by anecdotal experiences, it happened. Depends upon how, uh, because uh, mechanism-wise, heparin, mechanism -wise, heparin uh, basically stops the propagation of the clot. It is not a thrombolytic. It uh, propagation, but suppose if there's a small clot, it prevents its propagation. Uh, it, is, it is possible. It's not guaranteed, but it's possible. So we have heparin is a hated word. Heparin. If you if you talk in if you talk in favor of heparin, you are uneducated. But there are enough incidences, anecdotes, some of which I have myself experienced, where heparin has been shown to really be wonderful. This possible. Was a surprise for us. Possible. Real surprise for us. Yeah, it is surprising because it changed. Yeah, because flushing is used with a very small doses. So it is not like a therapeutic dose of uh, giving a big bolus of heparin. So that's true. It's very difficult to say comment. Why why did it open, sir, in your opinion? This was really surprising for just 15 minutes difference. And the argument I was saying that spontaneous. Why interesting? Why it did not happen for eight hours suddenly? Then he gave the final answer. We touched it, sir. <laughs> the patient had magic touch. Beyond that, we couldn't say anything. <laughs> good results, and we are happy. That is all. No, yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, you, you are right. You are right that uh, that uh, it is not a thrombolytic agent. You know, mechanically, or maybe maybe it was just by chance that at that time it had to. You know, clot can. From a clot can spontaneously also get resolved or thrombolyzed. Maybe it was, maybe, maybe heparin gave it just that little push. It was already on its way to resolution and then heparin <laughs> gave it a little push. It's also possible. Yeah. 
So did the patient improve at that time? Was yes, there sir, improved. The came out of the lab, not immediately, I would say, but rapid improvement was there for the patient. Very rapid improvement subsequently. And they were very thankful to us. They saw, they thought that only with the cath lab we have improved. So <laughs> we had to tell them that uh, we have not given anything there. And they said, no, 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 modesty. That's why we are also happy. They are happy, sir. That's all. But the truth is that nothing we did. Good. Two great cases, sir, really. <laughs> So sometimes the opposite also happens. I remember a case where, as sir said, the intervention is not available. So once you, the relatives come to know that the intervention is required and intervention is not available, that's the bigger problem. So now the protocol is first find out whether it is available or not and then give the option. Correct. Yeah, they get fixes. They get obsessed with something which is not available. They will blame you for yes, it. Yes, yes, yes. So it happens. <laughs> The same things that when our interventional radiologist goes for the conference, probably they are attending together, sir, <laughs> with your interventions. It really creates trouble. But in Madre, what we do is that, sir, they, what they do is that at least one is available in the city. We are, there are three in our city. So they see to that at least one is available in the city. One, the two, uh, two other guys go and tell each other and go. So that way we have an advantage. Otherwise, it is real trouble. Oh, I think uh, I think I think both cases were very great. You know, we have experience and we have seen these kinds of cases before. They only revalidate our impressions. But you know, there are a lot of people who are who are watching this webinar and who are new in thrombolysis. I think for them, it's a great lesson that they should never give up in any situation. Even if they are in the remote area, they should not think it's a large artery block. Therefore, I have to send no. You just do what is available at the time. You, I, you. That's the message for them. And similarly, that endovascular, the first case, that also is very good. Where you have, when we think that intra arterial thrombolysis is out, uh, still has a place in It just depends on how much initiative we are able to take and how much risk we are able to take for the benefit of the patient. Sometimes you have to do that, that extra inch matter. So great cases, congratulations, everybody. So, call, sir, I want to know one thing from you. Yes, sir. Since you have so much of experience on this. So what is what do you think is a contraindication in your eyes at present if for IV thrombolysis, apart from the frank bleed which we see? So a patient is on has been on low, double antiplate lately. He has been on low molecular weight heparin. So you do think those are contraindications? They are not contraindications. You, you go I ahead. Think, I think uh, they are not. I, I think... Uh, I would like to know your opinion also and uh, Meenakshi Adhya's opinion also, but I think major contraindication is a brain hemorrhage. But let me tell you one thing. I have, I mean, <laughs> this is just out of personal. I have seen some patients where a minor sulcal bleed was missed and they were thrombolytes. And bleeding did not increase in them. But I would not, I would not recommend that to do it. But in spite of that, uh, because that was after TPA was given and patient improved also. Then, then we picked up there was a minor bleed. So nobody talked about it. But uh, but but hemorrhage is definitely absolute contraindication. This is one. Second is if you have had a major surgery. Uh, major surgery means something like a coronary artery bypass. Something like an abdominal surgery. In the preceding two weeks, I would be hesitant. But minor surgery is not a, at all a problem means ophthalm, ophthalmic surgery, even uh, uh, ENT surgery, you know, something which is superficial and that's not a cause. But major surgery would be another contraindication. And uh, third is that, because I have burnt my fingers, is this uh, stroke, ischemic stroke in the last one month, I think. Although it is written three months as per the guidelines. But major surgery is in the last one month, uh, major, uh, sorry, ischemic stroke in the last one month is a contraindication because, again, that area is little ischemic, little soft, and you may bleed. In it. Other than these three, or, or trauma in the last one month. Other than these three, uh, I don't know what uh, means. 
any, any I can't think. Can you think of any other content? Everything so, is allowed now. Even guidelines yeah. are allowed. Yeah. Acute anti the one myocardial infarction in the preceding two weeks. But is not an absolute contraindication. Not an absolute contraindication. They are allowing it. You, 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 you. I have checked the recent guidelines. It used to be two years back absolute contraindication. But if you see 2021 guidelines, uh, they are saying that there is a net benefit in that also. That uh, risk of cardiac rupture and risk of pericardial thing has been tampana. thought to be uh, very little, and uh, net benefit is there. That also is not a, most of them have become now uh, only absolute contraindications are. I'll tell you I, 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 because I have reviewed this so many times. Uh, one is uh, APTT if it is much beyond forty. That's absolute contraindication. If your uh, INR is more than one point seven. And the patient is on oral anticoagulants. That's absolute contraindication. If you have a major surgery, maybe, or if you have a brain hemorrhage, most of the times you will find a reason to give. Therapeutic heparin, sir. Huh? Therapeutic, Therapeutic heparin also heparin. is a contraindication. And what about the NOAX? If a no, NOAX, a... everybody knows. No, no, NOAX is that if it is uh, given less than 48 hours, then you should not uh, thrombolyze yeah. unless. You have given them idrusuzumab yeah. for dabigatron. For dabigatron. Yeah. So we, the, we have taken at those surgeries which are compressible site. We, we, we give those which are recent and non-compressible, just avoid. So what was your will, uh, experience in surgeries? In surgery, so there have been not many cases, but those which have been, so internal surgeries, so someone got a gallbladder operated and there is a dick inside, we don't do it. Hernia, fine, we'll do it. So that way. So things which are more superficial, ENT, we will do it. Compressible. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, so yes. so oh, things yes. like that. So compressible versus non compressible. Yeah, I have uh, my, my experience is that you know, initially we used to be worried even about gum bleeding. But as time went on and we learned, yeah. now I have given in many patients following cataract surgery uh, and nothing has happened. ENT surgery, nothing has happened. Uh, no, not even bleed also. And of course, in one is diabetic retinopathy, in which there is bleed also, in which it is allowed. Now, guidelines also say that you can go ahead and give. So today, before we think it's a contraindication, we should check the literature. Is it really a contraindication? Because again, the patient may catch our caller next. That's why you didn't yeah. give me. Because there are hardly any contraindications. Only these three, four are. Most of them, at least you have to give option to the patient. I think better to give the option to the patient and tell them that there's a risk, higher risk. Guidelines are not very clear, but if you say we'll do and we have given earlier. And exactly. if they agree, better to give it. Absolutely, I completely agree. So another another bugbear of this is this contraindication. The bugbear is <laughs> this mild deficit. <laughs> and mm -hmm. we have had discussion on this before. You know, and particularly this mild deficit fellow is a VIP. You see, if the mild deficit would happen in a normal, ordinary person like us, then it is not a bugbear. Then we listen, no, okay, it's not. But he is generally either MLA or your director's brother or a Supreme Court judge's cousin, and he comes with a mild pronated drift. Now, you don't know should you give or not, because if you, you are damned if you give, you are damned if you don't give. So though that, that has been an issue with me. Uh, what to do. Uh, but if you see, guidelines are clearly saying, guidelines I'm talking, that if you think it is disabling stroke, that even if it is mild, you give it. And I think uh, Meenakshi and me had a discussion that we think that every neurological deficit is potentially disabling, even if it's a pure. So we can document that thing and then give it. Unless patient himself refuses, which, which is a blessing if the patient refuses himself. <laughs> that, you know, that, that I find very stressful. You know, when a patient has a mild deficit and to give or not to give. But if you see, those mild deficits also bleed very rarely. So it's okay to give, I think, in those situations. That's the true. One, yeah, so the chances of bleed are also little. Small you see, that, strokes, that yeah. is what we thought and that is what Pooja Khatri thought. Pooja Khatri is a very, he's the eminent stroke specialist at this time in the world. We should all be proud of us. He's from, he's a Punjabi from Chennai, basically. Her sister is still living in Chennai. 
And when Pooja Khatri comes, she goes to Chennai first because her family is in Chennai, even though they are Punjabis. So she is a number one stroke specialist in the world. We are thinking of inviting her next year to India. So she led this. She was a big proponent. Any number of papers by her that why are we excluding mild strokes from thrombolysis? This is wrong. There is no data to substantiate. This NINDS trial has, they, according to NINDS trial, mild strokes are excluded. And what is mild strokes? Anything less than four. And it so happened that uh, there was no data actually. There was no data. In fact, if you, if you, it was done purely for safety of the patient. But if you trash the data and go into it, what they have seen is that those mild strokes who were thrombolysed, they did very well actually in NINDS data. You know. So therefore, she said, she came with a hypothesis, we should thrombolyze mild study. And uh, they did a study which Meenakshi often li likes. That's called PRISM study. Now, in the PRISM study, they took very mild uh, strokes and uh, non-disabling strokes, mild strokes. And, um, uh, and what happened is that they could not get enough cases over the course of time. You know, they could not get enough cases. So therefore, there was a funding problem. So they could get only some one third or some proportion of cases what was supposed to be done and they did an interim analysis of those cases and in those cases they found that that the that those mild strokes which were thrombolyzed there was little more bleed which unfortunately crossed that statistical line because <laughs> so then they said that there is a some three percent bleed three percent bleed compared to those based on that then and then she herself was very embarrassed but the study was imperfect study was not complete and uh, but but because of that they say that mild strokes but only only good thing they have written is that mild strokes which are non disabling need not be thrombolyzed uh, but that the million dollar question is who will decide now they have said that non disabling means which does not interfere in his day to day activity of life and they have defined those also what are his day to day activities of life like wearing his clothes brushing teeth, shaving. And if these are not interfere, then it is uh, thought to be it's a non-disabling stroke. And so, but this, this remains a little bit of a, you know, mild pronated drift on left side. He may still be able to button, but would he, would, he may think it's disabling for him. So, 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 so to make the long story short, whenever a patient has any deficit, I give him the option. And, and the other thing is, which nobody talks, that that is the whole tragedy of stroke. We think of the deficit at this moment. We think it is mild disabling at this moment, but after half an hour, it may become uh, disabling. At this time, it is non-disabling. After half an hour, after all, what is the aim of thrombolysis? You are dissolving the clot. So you are preventing further progression. So he may be having non-disabling at this time at 9, nine o'clock and 8 minutes. But what about 9.15? By the time he may become disabled. So, so therefore, I think I would, I would thrombolize. I would, I would explore the maximum chance of thrombolizing each and every person. And I would try hard to see what is the contraindication. There's a contraindication, then obviously. Any, your, what are your comments, sir? I would like to, I'm more interested in learning from you. What is your experience? Uh, you're asking me? Yeah. Yeah, so sir, um, my comment is that I find a way to thrombolize, as I could say, said before, to find out how I can thrombolize unless there's a glaring contraindication, which we already discussed. So I would thrombolize a mild stroke and we have been doing it and with good results and rarely ever bleed. I don't remember having a bleed sort of in which I embarrassed myself and dis to do a non-disabling stroke, to a, do a whether disabling or a non-disabling mild stroke, except if there would have been a mild sensory deficit or something which does not, which cannot be documented uh, objectively, uh, I would thrombolize. I think Meenakshi has a story to tell about the sensory deficit, yes. which he didn't thrombolize. And the patient <laughs> is still blaming him. <laughs> is it? <laughs> would you tell us that story? <laughs> Same thing, sir. We didn't thrombolize a person saying that it is only numbness. The patient has not spared me, sir. More than 10 years, he has haunted me that you should have numbness to understand this. So any deficit is disabling for the patient. So that's a great learning I had with that patient. Because he asked, what do you think you have got numbness? If you have numbness, do you know what it means really? You For you, it is nothing. For me, it really means a lot of pain. And I came to you in right time. 
So he has got a valid is, point, is, but you have a but you have a defense. You could have said that uh, there is a there was a chance of bleed, you know. So I did not want to take the chance of that bleed, which is there. So seeing the risk benefit, see, I think it is. Uh, if things don't go the, the way that we plan, and sometimes the expectations are not met, then these things keep on coming sometimes, but they can be handled. But that is in general, most of the patients would accept that. Had this patient bled, then he would have blamed you more, you know. So that, even though the, the chances weakness, are very less. At least, the, the patient said, weakness at least I can do physiotherapy. What <laughs> physiotherapy for sensory loss you can do? So I was zapped really. Sad. There were two papers also at that time. This was several years ago. Two papers. Or one was a TGT paper. I think it came in 2005. These are patients who were considered by the treating physician as too good to treat. And I think one third of them could not be discharged home. It was from uh, one of the Western data that these patients had to go to halfway home or some you know, nursing institutions who were thought that too good to treat did not uh, were not good enough to be discharged. And there was another analysis, I think it was in 2011, of patients called risk. These were rapidly improving stroke symptoms. And when you look at it, the paper itself was titled that not a happy ending for people who had rapidly improved stroke symptoms. Risk. So these two were great uh, guidelines at that time. Again, Dr. Puja Katri Madam's data was actually not giving us enough, you know, will to say that, unfortunately. We were also looking at the data very closely, whether it would really help us. The conclusion was that there was a trend towards improvement within quotes and then within brackets, not statistically significant. That's how they had actually ended that paper. Yeah, correct. So I think thank you very much. I think we hand over to our, yes. our uh, MQR team, Ajinkya. Yes, sir. Hello. It was a wonderful, wonderful workshop, sir, uh, with so much of information for our audience. And I would like to thank all, all the faculty members for taking uh, some time out from your busy schedules on this evening of the weekend. And thank you, Jai sir, Dr. Sudhi sir, for presenting those uh, interesting cases. Sir. And also thank you, Dr. Kaul sir, Dr. Minachi sir, Dr. Nagbal sir, for your expert comments and great, great practical insights. And we would really like to work under your guidance for many such future programs. So with this short note, we will close this session and thank you everyone again. Uh, have a happy weekend and good night. Thank you.